there's something so powerful in worship and there's something so powerful in the Word of God. Um, how many of you believe that the Holy Spirit wants to meet you? So I want you to lift your hands up. And I want you to invite him and say, Holy Spirit, I want to meet you today. Holy Spirit, out of relationship, I'm asking you to invade your church. Amen. Well, great. Um, I never advertise anything I preach, but I'm actually going to uh, if you were here last week or if you've been here during any prophetic meeting um, and you missed what we did on Wednesday night to respond to the prophetic, um, we, we put out a message to respond to the prophetic and it's gone uh, quite viral on uh, Facebook, etc. If you haven't heard it, you might want to. How many of you know if you don't know how to respond when God talks to you, what's the point in talking to you? Yeah? Um, and then yesterday, we, we broached the subject of God restoring or renewing the soul. <coughs> and how many of you know the Bible tells us to, to bring my soul out of prison that I might praise your name? Yeah. And if we're going to have to be honest, and it's time to be honest, that sometimes things get snared up in our souls. And so we need that, that releasing. And so we taught on that yesterday. And uh, one minister said to me, when you get saved, you'll become a good preacher. So that was good. But, it, but if you really, really know, and you've got to know that there are areas of your soul that are not free. Isn't it funny how you can go country dancing, but you can't dance before the Lord? And I would never go country dancing, but I'm just letting you know you do it. It's, it's not my favorite music, but, um, but people will, won't you? You watch and go country dancing, but they won't come dancing before the Lord. That means there's something snaring you. It might be religion, all right? Or if you've ever made a vow out of your mouth, I'll never trust another person. How many of you know that you've got a wound? How about this one? I'll never trust another man. I've heard that. <laughs> There's only one, two people agreeing. Everybody else has said, no, I'm absolutely <laughs> perfected. But honestly, those little things give you a hint there's something not right. Per perfect love casts out our fear, but yet Christians fear. So what, what's there? What's happening? I mean, I don't mean don't fear heights that you go up 3,000 feet and jump off a cliff. I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about fearing just natural things. So um, we're going to do a lot more of that on Wednesday and actually going to minister to, to people's wounds. Uh, that's if they're honest enough to face them. The Bible actually says, confess your faults to one another and pray for one another that you might be healed. No, so if you refuse to do the one, you don't get the second. And you say, well, that sounds Catholic. No, the Catholics might have used that, but that's actually a biblical truth. You know, sometimes God uses men with gifts to set you free. Hands up all those who are absolutely, totally free. And I'm going to actually use the word liar. Because we're on a journey of freedom, aren't we? So, um, you know, it actually is the first Sunday that I've ministered since I did the prophetic thing at the beginning of the year. And the reason I travel at the beginning of the year is people like the prophetic. Um, but I'm trying to teach people it's not hearing God speak, it's knowing how to respond to Him speak. Have you ever been there where someone prophesies and other people clap? How does God need a clap? That would be like you as a father saying, son, son, I want you. Oh! I don't think you'd like that. I think you'd like the obedience to what was said. How many of you know that God knows a lot more about you than you do? And how many of you know in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says that God literally says, He's, I've got some plans for you i got plans to prosper you, to bless you. Here's the problem. How do I get my plan from my heart into your heart? And that's how he uses the prophetic and dreams, etc., etc., so he can reach your heart. But today I want to talk about a very strange thing for a few minutes. Um, 
I've learned not to try and follow up something like last week. You know, you, you say, well, are you going to prophesy this week? I might. But sometimes God says something that is different. For instance, how many of you know that, that a lot of people in here have seating that they, they always take? It's a reserved seat. Now, I never allow anyone to put reserved on my seat. I don't want to be reserved, all right? So in our church, you use designated. But that's, that's, that's the position that you want to sit in. You position yourselves in that seat. But how you position yourselves in that seat is what happens when you're in that seat. And you know, it's a very interesting word because I'm going to talk about the, the, the positioning of Christians. And it's very interesting because you don't see that word much in the King James. The reason you don't see the word in the King James because it didn't exist in those days. So if you, you read modern versions, the word position or positioning is used a lot more. Actually, the NIV uses it a few times in the New Testament. The positioning uh, where we are, our, our position in Christ. In fact, it takes, it takes Esther 4.14 and it says, Don't you know that you've come to a royal position for such a time as this? So when I talk about your position, it literally means your stance or stance. But I'm trying to teach you correct English, but I'm not winning. But your stance, it also means your position. But it also means how you position yourself. And it's very interesting, if I were to quote scriptures all morning and tell you who you are and what you are, it doesn't mean a thing unless you think you are. That's why he said to her, don't you know that you've come to a royal position for such a time as this? Uh, the, the original version, don't you know that you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this? I like that and I like, I like both of them because it means that there's a timing in God that God had for you to be born. And there was a time that only you could be you on this earth and only you could do what you could do in the kingdom. And you might say, well, I don't do a lot, but you don't realize who you are, so that's why you don't think you do anything. So I'm going to talk about four different places of positioning. I'm going to talk about, first of all, the positioning of relationship. You know, you can be born again but have no relationship. You can attend church and have no relationship. Hey, you can get married and have no relationship. And your relationship is everything. And how you act in God is how you're positioned in God. Uh, how many of you know that we're, we're heading for Super Bowl? Now, to one or two people, now the Dallas Cowboys are out, there is no Super Bowl. But there still is for other people. And a lot of people will set their affections on that game. Everything will be about that one game. And some people have just given up watching at all since Dallas lost. So your affections aren't on the game, your affections are on Dallas. And then we've got others who've got affections on certain people preaching. Well, who's preaching? Oh, it's him. And I've had that said about me. I, I, I preached alongside quite a famous preacher and I'd just come into the country and someone said, when's the real preacher preaching about me? Not mean I was the real preacher, the other guy was. And, uh, you know, one of the clever bod elders wanted to tell me that. I should have given him external healing and inner healing all at once and a deliverance from what I wanted to do to him. How many of you know you can have affection on certain worship leaders? But you see, in Christ, that's nothing. That's just preference. But your affections, according to Colossians 3.2, should be on Christ. It says in one version, set, set your gaze, set your view, but your affection. And you know, if you ever lose your affection in a marriage, it will change the relationship of a marriage. But when you're a Christian, your affection should go toward the Lord. That's how you can tell you're born again. I had a fantastic story. After I was prophesied about London, uh, I, I love prophecy because God's revealing something to you that you haven't known yet or is about, or you do know, and He's confirming it. And He gave me this prophecy about London. Well, that's good for me. 
I want to go home. Yeah, yeah. Because I miss home. So when he said that, I thought, ooh. And then I thought to myself, I know a lot of people in London, but who do I know with the mantle he's talking about? And suddenly I got led, because we do, I, I don't tell you everything because I don't want it to come over wrong, but we support a lot of people. We support a lot of older ministers. Uh, we send money to missions. We send money to orphans, etc. And And whenever we get blessed, I always take a section of it to, to bless some older ministries. Uh, I can tell you one of them. One of them is Paul Doherty. A, another one is Colin Carson. And another one is this guy called Michael Bassett. And I didn't realize as I was blessing Michael who he was. He used to be, uh, it's all right for me to tell you this because he's testified around the world, but before he was saved, he ran all the pornography rings. He ran them in Soho in London. He ran them in L.A. Um, he used to live with some very famous people that act of that life, Jesus appeared to him saved him on the spot and turned him around. He then goes back into London because he said, I, I want to just visit and talk to the people in the pornography rings what Jesus did for me. And so he goes back and he tells them and they all come out to listen to him preach. See, you would have said they're finished, but they're sinners. As a result of that, he starts the church. He said, I, don't know, I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never been trained to minister. I just started ministry. And it became the biggest church in Europe. And then at a certain stage, he just felt the Lord just tell him to let it go. And, but some of the biggest named ministers in England sat in his church. And I suddenly realized, I know the guy that carries the mantle. I've already met him. All right. And God is no joke when he talks to you about you. But you see, what happened to him? From one minute, he had his passions on worldly, nasty things. And the next minute, he met Jesus. And his passions turned to another thing. And he's lived his life. And today, he's 81. And he still talks about Jesus in the same way as he talked about him when he saved him. Because his passions changed. His affections changed. And our positioning as Christians is that we need to have a relationship that is affectionate toward the Lord. Our affection should be toward Him. And if, and if they're not toward Him, you need to be able to look and honestly say, maybe my positioning is wrong. Maybe I prefer sport. Maybe I prefer to watch movies. My affection is not toward where it should be. Because relationship starts with something of desire for affection. But secondly, out of any affection that goes anywhere, and we're trying to talk within the realm, obviously, of, of purity, but affection turns into intimacy. Yeah. That's why the Song of Solomon is so powerful. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Your love is more delightful than wine. Let him do it. Now he's done it. Now it's you. And, and pleasing are the fragrances of, of your perfumes or, or, or your anointing is affecting me and your name is like anointing poured out. Ha, no wonder the maidens love you. Oh, take me away with you. Come, let the king bring me into his chambers. The king has brought me into his chambers. Why? Because when there is an affection, you want to be intimate with that one that you're affectionate with. And I could take you through a lot of the Song of Solomon. But here's the bottom line, is you, you should have a, an intimacy with the one who saved you. I mean, I'm not joking, and some of you that know me know this, but I, I've had some experiences with the Holy Spirit, so much so that sometimes when I talk to Him, this is truth, sometimes when I talk to Him, He, he will so fill the car, you don't know what to do with yourself. And sometimes when I address him when I'm preaching, he'll fill an atmosphere of a church. That's a relationship. That's an intimacy. That's a friendship. You see, you can say I'm a believer, but a believer is not someone who is intimate. That's just someone who believes. But someone that has a relationship has positioned themselves to have a relationship of intimacy. 
Now you've got this, you've got the affection, you've got the intimacy, but then there's the walk. Uh, some of you know that. Th this year we are actually um, planning to be married 50 years. On, on, on March the 17th, I've never forgotten our anniversary. I need to explain why. I'm Irish. And Irish people, March the 17th is easy to remember. And I knew I was in trouble because my wife came in and I, I used to work in a pub, you know, uh, and you used to say in London, a rubber dub. I used to work in a pub and I got saved and it took me a while to transition out of certain things. And she came to me in the pub and she said, I found a date for our marriage. I said, when is it? And she said to me, March the 17th. I said, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't touch an Irishman on March the 17th. And then she said to me, I knew trouble was coming. She went, just like that. And she said, if you don't marry on March the 17th, you don't marry. Right. <laughs> we to never forget our anniversary. The second thing is I never forget her birthday. Do you know why? Because I was actually born two days before she was. I don't mean two days of, we, we are literally two days in difference. So I never forget her birthday. It's, um, no, I never forget. <laughs> but we're planning, and I use the word planning because the Bible tells us that we should never say tomorrow we'll do anything. And so we're planning by the grace of God that this year is our 50th anniversary. How many of you know we have had times, please don't get this wrong, of intimacy? Of course we have. We've had times of affection. But our main thing was to walk together. Now, if you really have the right relationship with the Lord, you're going to want to walk with Him. It tells us, literally, uh, the first time walking with God is mentioned is Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked with God. And he was not because God took him. He wanted the walk to continue. Then Noah, next chapter, in, in Genesis 6 and verse 9, walked with God. But so can we. And if we are positioned for a relationship, then we need to learn to walk with him, not tell him to walk with us. And you see, this is the position we should be in because a lot of the Christians are need-based, which means you meet my need, you come to me in my time of need. And yes, he will, but that's not what he said to the first disciples in Matthew 4.19. He said, you follow me and I will turn you into fishes of men. The walk is run by me, not by you. I'll come to get you, I'll introduce myself to you, but the moment you meet me, the walk is bound with me. You've got to learn to walk with me. And in Galatians 5 and verse 25, it tells us all of us can not only be led by the Spirit, but walk with the Spirit, because the Holy Spirit wants to lead us in our walk. It tells us in, in Romans 8 verse 14 that the sons of God are led by the Spirit of God, which means we can have such a relationship that it's not just affection. We can have such a relationship that it's not just built on those moments of intimacy like that when the Holy Spirit came down. But it's built on a walk. It's built on a history. We've got history with our God. We walk with Him every day. We're led by Him. We learn the traffic light signals. We know when it's green light, red light. We know when He says, like for instance, Wednesday night was very interesting. Uh, we decided not to have, have the, the meeting on Wednesday night for a reason. There was a lot of ice around. Some of us grew up in it. So we're a little different. But some didn't. So we looked at where the city was going to get cold, and we found out some of the city was not going to warm up. But I don't know if you've noticed how many trees have come down. And I've really loved it. I was in the park yesterday. Not only did trees come down, but I noticed some of them were rooted up. And I thought, bad roots. A little bit of ice and you're rooted up. But on Wednesday, I drew into the parking lot. I was the first one in here, even before Demont. I was the first one in here. And I went to park in a certain place. And I felt God say, don't park there. So I went to move around to another place. And I felt, no, don't park there. And so I moved three down. 
And then Chris came in later and he moved next to me. He went to get out of his car and a branch of the tree fell on the parking lot, the spot I would have parked in. And not only a branch, a big branch that would have smashed the car or killed me if I'd have got out of the car. That is the Holy Spirit telling you something. You're walking with me. You're learning my voice. I'm telling you, don't do that. Uh, some of you get drawn into business things you should never have gone into if you had walked with God. And yet equally, there are doors in front of you that you don't know are there because you don't walk with God. But when you walk with God, He begins to tell you things and show you things and you have dreams. That's why it's so important. I was going to tell you that Greg so prophesied, but he didn't just so prophesy. He prophesied what Paul Doherty had seen in a vision a few weeks before. Now Paul's contacted me again. And Paul said to me, for two nights running, I have dreamed about great grace he said I've dreamed I was standing there I was dreamed I was ministering of what the Lord told me to say and he said I can tell you God's purpose for great grace now what's that about it's the Holy Spirit who he's walking with saying I've got plans for that church but I got to get it through to them that it's not just them thinking about the plans it's me declaring the plans so he's not only wanting to walk with you but he wants other people who walk with him to help you on your walk so that's your first position, your, your relationship. And I, I challenge you, what's it like? That's the quietest I've ever heard it in a church. I didn't hear, I lot, saw a lot of people looking at the shoes they never polished. <laughs> but the truth is, that should be our position. If nothing else, that is our position. Now secondly, I want to quote again what I said at the beginning. The Lord gave this to me in stages this morning. My positioning in Christ is where I sit with Christ. But the problem is, a lot of people know theory but don't know practice. You know, it's very interesting that, you know, one of the royals right now, and I was praying with all my heart, it wasn't him that I had to minister to. Because I don't believe people should publicly speak against their family. Anybody here agree with me? That's just wrong, all right? And, uh, but something went wrong with one of the royals. And he suddenly realized he didn't really want to sit in the position he was given. So he's chosen to abscond from his position. It happened before, of course. One of the kings, who was known as the Duke of Windsor, decided because he, he, he fell in love with an American called Mrs. Simpson. And, and uh, she hadn't just been married once. She'd been married three times. And so because he was the head of the Church of England... He could not, in those days, marry a divorced woman and stay the head of the Church of England. So he made his choice to give up his royal position. And he spent the rest of his life actually in misery. Because, because when he came to America, America doesn't understand royalty. Because they don't have royalty. And so suddenly, that which he was given, he was no longer walking in. And every one of you that knows the Bible, if I said to you Ephesians 2 and verse 6 or 2 and verse 5 about the grace of God given you and he has raised us up and seated us, verse 6, in heavenly places next to or alongside Christ Jesus, there's not one of you that wouldn't say, yeah, really. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you do it. How many of you loved chemistry at school? Well, I knew you would, of course. But chemistry's got two sides to it, isn't it? It's got theory and practice. I like the practice. I like Bunsen burners and things blowing up. In the, I love all that. But the theory got up my nose. You know, you watch this, you know, and sometimes teachers forget that they know it and you don't. They're supposed to get you there. It's like fractions. I know some clever person who say, will say, oh, I understand fractions. Well, good for you. What a waste of time. Right? But you've got to get your theory to pass your exam. How many of you know in America, before you can be a pass a driving test, you need theory? And then after theory, if you can't pass your theory, you, you can't take the driving test. It's no point in taking the driving test if you don't know the theory. And the theory is, you're seated with him 
in heavenly places. That's the theory. But it's like when I passed the, my driving test in England, which is totally different driving than here. All right? It's totally different driving. You have to know the width of your car. You have to build a starter car uh, with, with a stick shift up a hill without going backwards. You have to do a three-point turn in an area as big as this. It's all sorts of things they make you do. When I passed my test, I felt like victory. Some people never pass that test. And, and one man, when the man said to me when I passed my test, he said, you passed your test. Well done. Now learn to drive. And you can sit there and say, in theory, I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm nothing but royalty, in theory. But if we don't know, learn to position ourselves in practice where we know we are in theory, then it's only a theory. It's the positioning of it. You see, we are seated in theory, and actually in God we are. But if we don't know it, that's why, that's why in Esther, Mordecai has to say to Esther, don't you know that you've come to the kingdom? Don't you know that you've come to a royal position for such a time as this? You see, yes, I know. No, you don't know because you're not sitting there. You're still sitting as a pauper. You're still sitting with a cultural view. How many of you know if you've really transferred into the kingdom, you happen to live in America? That doesn't make you an American Christian. It makes you a Christian who lives in America. Don't take American Christianity and stamp it on the kingdom. Stamp the kingdom on American Christianity and we'll turn America back. But you've got to understand, culture can affect your seating. Where you came from can affect your seating. I've told you this story before, but it really means a lot. When I was in Louisiana, and I've been told to behave in how I pronounce that. But when I was, living, when, when I was ministering in Louisiana, I was on the north shore of, of the lake that, you know, that, that broke, or Pontchartrain. And, and I, was, I was literally on the north shore, and I noticed that a track had come from New Orleans all the way to the north shore. And I'm just nosy. You'll find out that I rent cars... And I, I drive around in cities to find out where I am, just, just the way I am, right? And I suddenly saw a railroad track, and I stopped, and I got on the railroad track, and I looked back at the road, and then I looked on the, on the other side of the railroad track, and, and there was swamp. And something said to me that it wasn't even the Holy Spirit itself, don't go there. There are alligators in there. Wisdom says, stay on the track. And as I stood on the track and I looked down and, I, and then I went like that and I looked up, I said, Lord, they're always telling me there's a right and a wrong side of the track. I was, I was born on the wrong side of the track. I, I lived on the right side of the track. I said, Lord, where's the right side of this track? He said, there isn't a right side nor a wrong side. There's only a track. And the track is where you have been taken to in Christ, not where you came from. And if you still live in where you came from, number one, you need to be in Wednesday night's healing meeting. And number two, you'll never take your royal position. Because you will think of yourself differently than the Lord wants you to think. You getting it? Just to prove something to you about cultural things. Um, it's not always been fun being over here with a different accent. No, it hasn't. And I've chosen not to take on the accent. I, I think you know I mean, well enough to know I can mimic most things. And I can mimic your accent. I can mimic your accent, the California accent, the New York accent. But I refuse to let my accent go. Why? Because it's mine. It belongs to me. You. Yeah. But we did a meeting. I'd only been here three months, only in the country, three months. And I did a meeting on, on unity, and I told the people that if they had anybody that they had something wrong with, that they needed to just go put it right, I did not know that the line that was the longest would be mine. <laughs> I was told all sorts of things. And as I was having all these people come up to me, one person said to me, I hate British people. I went, oh. Yo lo siento. 
no entiendo. And so, <laughs> I suddenly found out that there are people who have got issues and are Christians with other Christians and so are not sitting where they should be sitting because they've got issues that they won't deal with. Now, I didn't say you're supposed to like everybody the same. You don't even like your own family all the same. I'm looking for more honesty in this place. But you are supposed to be in Christ Jesus. And you're supposed to love people despite their differences. So if I find out that I am seated with Christ, then I have got to position myself not from my culture, not from myself, but from Christ. He who is the one I now sit in, if I will become in Christ, it will change the way I act. Because the moment I'm seated in Christ and with Christ, I now change my view of how to act out the way I am. This is no longer a theory the moment I know it. Because the enemy can attack you, but if you're in Christ, you've got an answer in Christ. You can't, I'm in Christ. Well, you're a sinner. No, I'm not. No, I am not. I am in Christ. I might have been one and I might trip up, but I am in Christ. Your natural man's always telling you you're useless. Yes, you are. But not in Christ. In Christ, anything can happen with you. When I hear these crazy prophecies, I say, Me? Que señor? Me? And the Lord says, you're not getting it. It's not you. It's me in you. It's not how well you do. It's how well I can do through you if you will sit in me. Hands up those who are in Christ. Hands up those who actually act like they are. I, <laughs> this is not just a behavioral study. I didn't say that you always walk around saying, yes, I'm in Christ. But it, it's in your spirit. I am in Christ. You know how I learned it? I told you this before. I learned it when a demon attacked me. And as the demon attacked me, I found out who I was in Christ. And when I rose up of who I was in Christ, that thing backed off me real fast and every other one after it. Because I suddenly found out who I was. And you've got to get this. It's not the fact that I am seated. It's the fact that I am seated. And the moment I am seated, then it gives me a different understanding. That means I am a son of God. If I actually know that I am a son of God, I will then start to look for the things that a son of God should operate in and have from God. And I start saying, Holy Spirit, what is mine? Now I'm sitting there. How should I act in the circumstances that are thrown at me? Now I'm there. As I'm positionally seated, I want to know all that is at my disposal. You see, if you don't see it, you'll never ask for it. It'll change the way that you see Christianity. It also tells us in, in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 that we are a royal priesthood. See, we're not just a priesthood. We're a royal priesthood. Does anyone know that, what that just said? You, you minister from a different position. It means that because I am in Christ, I am royal in Christ, I'm a priesthood now that can minister on behalf of others before the Father alongside Christ because I have a position to stand in the courts of God. I'm not this pauper that's coming and saying, God, is it okay if I come in? He says, son, you're in. Now lift up your hands and minister on behalf of that person. But I'll tell you more, son. If you understand where you are as a royal priest, I can give you things to minister to that person because you understand who you are. In God is no respecter of persons. Nobody's better than anybody else in Christ. Even if they do have a big television thing named after them. It might be that they just found out who they were. Is, is anything registering? 
See, it's the position of relationship, it's the position of my seatedness. It hasn't stopped. It's only the beginning. Now, I need to learn now my position of standing. Can I just say this? I'll do it with a British accent. I'm a man of standing. What does that mean? In Britain, a man of standing means a man of position. That's all it means. It means if, if a person comes out from the queen or the king now and has been knighted, dubbed, and they come out now and, you, and they, they now call them Lord somebody. Like anybody here of the great athlete Sebastian Coe? One of the greatest runners that ever lived. And he got dubbed on both shoulders. He's now Lord Coe. Lord Coe. I was just a runner, but now I'm a man of standing. I'm a lord. I'm royalty. So when he comes in a room, because he's a lord, you stand up. He's a man of standing. He knows how to stand because of his standing. If you know who you are, you'll know how to stand because of your standing. You see, it tells us in Ephesians 6, and I'm just taking from 10 on, on, it says, you know, you should be strong in the Lord in the power of his might, that you might be able to take your stand against all the wiles of the enemy. The wiles of the enemy are the evil schemings of the enemy, which he knows about your family. He's known your family and all the curses of your family, and so he schemes against you with those weaknesses. Have you ever noticed that you've got tendencies to be a certain way? That's your family. And so he comes against your family, and it says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. And then it comes back down again. It says, look, you've got to stand. You've got to learn how to stand. And you've got to stand with the whole armor of God put upon you, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, etc. And having done all to stand, stand. Yeah. Now, a lot of people positionally love Jesus. And a lot of people get some of where we sit. But very few know because of who we are, how we stand. Uh, I learned this in natural fighting from, from many years ago, that how you stand is how you, you take a hit. You know, the best thing, there were two very famous people called the Cray brothers, the, the Cray twins, and, and they knew how to punch people and, and, and break their jaws. You know what they did? They offered them a cigarette. As the guy took the cigarette, opened his mouth, the moment the jaw was open, <laughs> breaks his jaw. Just knew how to do it, see? So anyone that understood that wouldn't take the cigarette. But if you learn anything about, any, anything about fighting, and, it, and it's a long time ago, there were certain things that you learned. Like, you know, when big guys set themselves up against you, like Dustin's always pretending he's so big, see? And when they set this up, all you do is you learn to come back and stand. And it's how you stand is how you rock and how you move and how you react. For instance, if you stand right, and you stand right, and it's got to be right, you hit me on that knee, this one will take it. If you hit me on that knee, this one will take it. But if you stand wrong like that, you are dead. Yeah. You know, if you notice big people say, yeah, and they stand like that. Easy pickings. <laughs> there are parts of men that should not be mentioned. Don't stand like that. <laughs> Secondly, if you stand wrong, all I got to go is one like that and break your kneecap. Yeah. All right? The enemy knows how to break your kneecap. Unless you know positionally how to stand. Be strong in the Lord. How's your relationship now, my friends? Now the storm is coming. Not how are you dancing at the front. How is your relationship now? The storm is coming. How is your relationship when every odd turns against you and you, even your own family might do it. How are you standing now? Are you all emotion? Are you led by the soul? Or is there something in your stand that says, I know this is rocky, but I know my God and I'm standing. And having done all to stand, I'll stand. Do you know how to put the armor of God on? We don't have time for all this. Do you know what the belt of truth is? The Bible. But equally, it's truth. How many of you ever had someone say anything against you? And you have to say to the person who listened, who told you that? And they'll say, so-and-so did, but have you ever asked me the truth? 
No, I'd rather listen to gossip and judge you and take myself out of where I stand. But we need to be able to know truth, stand in truth, and speak truth. And sometimes when you're in a hard time because we stand because the enemy's coming against us, it doesn't say now you're in Christ, you're going to get left alone. In fact, I'm going to give you a terrible hint. He said, no, I won't look at you. The further you go, the more you're attacked. The enemy can only attack what he thinks you don't know. But when you do know what you know, then you will use what you know, which is the truth, back. That's why when the enemy came after Jesus, he kept saying, it is written, it is written, it is written. You can't talk to me like that. It is written. I know the truth. You're twisting the truth. But boy, what a place, the belt of truth. Breastplate of righteousness. It means, are you right with God? Are you right with you? Hey, did I just say something? Let's try that again. Are you right with God? Oh, yes. Are you right with you? Ooh. Because if I'm not right with me, I'll join in the enemy against me. Here it goes. Here it goes. Are you right with the person next to you? Well, then there's no breastplate. There's no defense. Your heart is open to be shot. You've got to learn how to stand. You've got to get the helmet of salvation. Your greatest problem and my greatest problem is called stinking thinking. It's called being confirmed to the spirit of this age. It's thinking like the TV tells you to rather than thinking like the Word tells you to. Man, you're making me work hard. I hope there's some lunch. The reason I'm working on it is it's so... Do you understand we can have all the movements and the spirit of God everywhere and you can't stand? But if you can stand, you're a testimony to the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? Sword of the Spirit, do you know how to use the Word of God? Not against each other. How many people have used the Word of God to put someone else down? That's not where you're standing. You're standing with the sword of the Word of God against the enemy. And what about this shield of faith? Gee, you can't hit me, mate. <laughs> By the time I talk to you about the Romans, I'd even tell you why the British drive on the other side of the road. Not the wrong side of the road. That's because the side the Romans used to march on is the side they drive on. But it's really interesting. If you watch them with their shields, they had shields there, the people at the front, shields there, the people at the side, and the people in the middle, shields there. And no arrow could get through the shields because they knew how to use their shield. And we need to know how to use our shield of faith. Faith is so simple. Don't make it complicated. Faith is based on who God is. That's what my faith is. And faith is based on what God says. Faith is not based on my performance. All I got to do is stand. And all I'm using is the faith. And we've got to get, because when you're attacked, come on, please be real with me in this place. Don't you, you, you have a moment where you start, well, who are you really? And the first attack of the enemy, and by the way, I wrote a book about it called Standing in the Perfect Storm. It would, might be very useful to you. Shows the attacks and how to stand. And, and, and very, very often, you see, when we're under that moment, the real truth of our faith comes up. And sometimes when you don't feel, you don't need a lot. You just need to know who he is and what he said about himself. But it grows as you walk through these fights. Come on, guys, has anybody fallen down and never hurt something? And your belief system, no, I should never have hurt something. No, you've hurt something. Now, now can God heal you? Can I stand in God? Can, it, we're always telling God that he's wrong because we don't understand the ways of God. He wants you to stand. He wants you to be a person, position, who knows how to fight back. And so we could go on. It says of Shama. It's a nice name, isn't it? Shama. When you pray in tongues, it's somewhere there, isn't it? Shut up. Shama. All right. You got it. It's in 2 Samuel 23, 12. It says, Shama took his stand. 
knowing who he was. He was a mighty, he was one of the mighty men of David. He got his sword out and he took his stand. And he said, you've got to get through me to get to that field. And he took his stand and it says his, his hand froze to his sword. It became one with his sword because he took his stand. Uh, now listen to what I'm saying. He took his stand. See, often we, we mouth a lot, but we don't know who we are enough. And so when things come at us, I mean, honestly, you're American, so let's go somewhere. It's one thing I can test an American. It's not just health. It's money. There is something based in the, in, in the society here. Money is a big boy. And, and if we get tested on our money, that will tell us where we really are. But do you know that I am the Lord that, 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 that provides? I, have you given? Have you been a giver? Can you quote back to God? Yes, I have. I have. I have. I have. This is my, my promise from you. I have. Because there will be times when you'll wonder where the next penny is coming from. Suddenly you get fired and you didn't do anything. But what you didn't know, it was a promotion on the way. You're so busy wagging your finger at God telling him about the injustice that you didn't stand. And it's horrible when you go home and they won't stand either. But we've got a, I think we've got a fair balance. I think I get told off more by my wife than anybody else. And listen, and should do. Because your wife knows you. And, you know, even if you look like, you know, you walk in and you've got the best suit, you've got the best car, you've got the suave look. The real you is at home in the shower. I'm not prophesying, I'm not prophesying. But, but the bottom line is, your wife knows that. And, and you don't realize that t preachers get some of the worst temptations because, because they're looking to see if they can minister to you. So we get it. But we are the best. I'll tell her off. She'll tell me off. No, 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 that's not the word of God. And if that doesn't work, she will goad me. Now, what do you mean by goad me? Tell me you can't do it. Oh, don't ever. The reason I was always in trouble at school is the school rules were simple. There were 12 school rules, and it's what they told me not to do, I would do. But what she does is she says, no, I'm helping you stand. You're not acting like a man of God right now. You're acting like a, a baby that's given up his stand. We need each other, don't we? And it feels awful. Could I mention this to you, Pastor? You're a wimp. Or if you from Yorkshire, you're a great wimp. You're acting like a great wimp. That's Smith Wigglesworth talk like that. But sometimes we need that to help us stand. You've got to make a choice. He took his stand. Whatever you're facing, you've got a position you can take. I am in royalty. I sit with Christ even if I don't feel like it. I'm in relationship with the Holy Spirit. I know I am. And it's not based on my failures, it's based on his success. I say, therefore, there are times to, I must take my stand. Last position, and it's really important. A real person of Christ is a longing person. Proverbs 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. Notice what it says, tree of life, going back to the tree of life. A longing fulfilled. You see, God puts something in us if we're really taking our position seriously that we don't just sit back and say, done it, sign the yellow card, on my way to heaven, won't be moved. That's not true. The truth is if you start in a company, you want to raise, rise up in that company and fulfill something. There's not a person in here that doesn't want to fulfill something or own something because something's been put in you that way. And when you come to Christ, He begins to dream in you. He begins to think in you. He begins to position you so that you can gain what He wants you to have. So this, this is what I call, this is the side of our positioning where we're like we're in a race. We're positioned to go further. We're positioned to gain more. I wrote my wife uh, the introduction to, to, to the next book I'm writing, and, it, and it's actually a book on, on ever-increasing anointing. And I'm about to prove to you that, 
that what you received at the beginning is not what you're supposed to have. That God wants to take you further in the anointing. And Christy said, but a lot of people won't want to read it. I said, yeah, a lot of people don't want to eat at Taco Bell either. You get what I'm saying? I'm not after the ones that are not interested. I'm after the ones that are interested. I'm a, it, it might be a select crowd. It might just be a few people. But it's a few people who actually understand why they got saved. What's the point of you living and dying and positionally having nothing in God and going to heaven and saying, what, what was that for? So there's something being put in all of you. I'm going to do this quickly. So there's a, there's a, there's a chase in us. There really is a chase in us. And so sometimes it's need-orientated. What is that? The woman with the issue of blood, she has a need. The need makes her go to press in to get something to change. And you might need to have a need to change you from where you are to get this longing that goes after something more in God. You know, you know even if you're passive, your kids walk away from God, your passivity stops. If your husband goes off the deep end, you want to go in the deep end and get him back out. Why? Because your passivity stops. Because something is need orientated. If, if there's no money, you change. Suddenly your prayer, your prayer goes, oh my God, this is not how we should be. Even the passive ones of you are now making a noise. You're at the Super Bowl in God. <laughs> and people always say, there's something wrong with you, Dennis. You're always wanting more. Because he wants me to have more. Listen to what he says in John 4. This that I will give you will well up, well up within you into eternal life. It keeps flowing and going. I put knowledge in you. I put desire in you. I put thirst in you. Oh, that's my second point. Oh, my God, I thirst for you. My body longs for you. In a dry and barren land where there is no water, San Antonio. Who put that thirst in him? He didn't just wake up one morning and say, Oh, I feel thirsty. No, God stirred him to long to meet God more, to know him. Is there anyone here that worship that doesn't want to know him more? There is something being put in you, whether it's need orientated or thirst orientated, that makes you want more. I get jealous when anybody's got anything I haven't got. Really? I'm not talking about houses and cars. I'm talking about what something's got, something I haven't got. How do you get that? How did God touch you like that? And I want to know. And, it, and they'll always give me the same answer. I, they, they don't just, well, I was just laying there in bed being lazy and God just fell on me. No. <laughs> I just lay there and I was smoking a cigar as I was and, and God just <laughs> fell on me. No! So... <laughs> Something stirred up. See, I'm not religious, so I'll say anything, right? Something stirred up where a thirst came. And folks, he stirs it up. Or sometimes, come on, I want you to be real. You're making me work so hard. No wonder I need to minister other places. You make me work so hard. Anybody here ever been touched by God in any way? What does it do to you? It makes you want more of that. It's called the Elisha syndrome. God touches Elisha with something God wants Elisha to have. And when he's touched by it, he said, I, I want that. I, I want that. I desire that. I'll do anything to have that. Of course you will. Because you know it's yours. Yes, I do. How do I get it? And it stirs up a passion. To want more. It, it's in us, you see, my friends. And I'm going to say something. Don't, you don't look at me and tell me there's something wrong with me. Let me look at you and tell you there's something wrong with you. If you have none of that in you, something changed in your position in Christ. Now, I'm going to say something. You know, Brandon Cornelius, uh, my wife, I noticed story is already confident. He said, he said, you know, wh wh what's it like when you've got a pastor who tells you life what it is? And people's eyes are like that. And Christine went, yeah. But sometimes you need to know. If you have no longing for more of anything, 
you die. Because he isn't like that. He won't listen. Listen. He wants you to have everything he wants for you. It's for you. That's why he wants to touch you with what he wants to give you so that you will want what it is. You've got this thirst then stirs up in you. And how about this? Sometimes he'll give you a promise. Now, you had to be me on Sunday. You, you, you know, you're all thinking, well, this is wild. You should have been me. I sat and then I went. And I told you there's a, there's a word in England. It's only in England that they use. It's called gobsmacked. It's like, that wasn't as bad as it sounded. But now I need to turn the other cheek because someone hit me on one cheek. So gobsmacked is where you go, are you talking to me? And, and at first I went home and Christian said, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. She even said to me, I don't know about that. And then I re-listened to that. And when I re-listened, I caught that. And God, by promise, said to me, I want to give you what I told you I wanted to give you years ago. And Caleb, 45 years. And, and what God does is he drops promises in dreams or prophecies. I love prophecy. You should be excited about the stuff. If God says something to you, I had a word for him the other day. It was minimal, but it was powerful. I said, you're going to like this one. And you see, you've got to catch this because God is dropping his thoughts into you, about you. He wants to show you an area of your future you haven't seen. And so what he does is he stirs you by the prophetic. Don't play this, well, let's just leave it on the shelf and see what will happen. No, following there. 1 Timothy 1.18, you follow it. What does it say? Well, I'd rather be much more passive than you are. I call it dead. I don't call it passive. How can you be alive for everything else but the things of God when the things of God are eternal life? You don't have a, an occasional shout. I mean, you know, the Bible tells us that we should go into our closet. Where's your closet now? Mainly the car. Now you shout when people cut you up. But don't you have an occasion? Oh! Do you don't do that? No? I, I need to know, is anybody here alive? Don't you think about something God said, Pooh, that's good. I was reading David versus Saul this week. Oh, it's good. David's a nobody, just like we were. And God touches David and gives him royalty, and everybody knows his name because he got touched by God. Let me tell you, he never stopped because of promises. Promise. He, I, I read this this week. Who am I, Lord? Who am I that you should take my family? Who am I? Just someone who gave yourself to me. That's who you are. God is no respecter of person. So I'm coming to an end because some of you are panting with desperation. But, you know, we could just go on with so many illustrations of Paul's got one. He said, look, I, 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 was, I love God. I, I just, everything was to know him, to know him. And then suddenly he took hold of me and he wouldn't let me go until I went after stretching out, racing out for all that he had for me. Uh, and my prophetic gift will do one thing. If I don't even prophesy, I can prophesy into the air that the, that the, that the longing for God, the passion for God will wake up in your soul. But my favorite one, and this is the last one, is Jabez. Now think this one through. 1 Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. It says Jabez was called Jabez because his mother birthed him in pain. This is the most illogical statement I've read in the Bible. His mother birthed him in pain. Ladies? How many of you just went, oh, I think I'm about to birth a child. Pop. Anyone just go, you know, hello, there you are. I didn't feel a thing. Most of you, 
uh, like you are with your kids, ladies, because in pain, not only did you carry them, but in pain, you birthed them. That's why, men, whatever we feel about our kids, we could never do what the ladies can do because of what they went through. It's just true. So what on earth is a mother cursing her son for? I birthed you in pain. You pain. It's like this is the most illogical statement I've ever read. So he grows up being cursed with being a pain. Can you imagine that every day? You pain. You go and meet your friends for coffee. Hey, pain, how's your pain? <laughs> Had a painful day? It wouldn't be long because I'm telling you, I know this because I was born and called Dennis in England when nobody was called Dennis in England. And Dennis the Menace did not start in America. It started in England and it started in a cartoon strip in, in, a, little, in a little comic thing for kids. And I looked like him. <laughs> Honest. And then the American Dennis the Menace joined it and they, they kept saying to me, Dennis the Menace, you're Dennis the Menace, you're Dennis the Menace. On and on and on. And so one day I said, do you want me to be a menace? I'll be a menace. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you call me Dennis the Menace, Menace will get you. Tasmanian devil now is coming over the bench. I just reacted to people mimicking my name. Then they, they lost one then because they started to say, Dennis the Menace can't play tennis, so I became the best tennis player in school. But that's just me. Can you imagine being called a pain? You blinking pain. Let's add a blinking on it. Let's give it a bit of a flipping because you know it wouldn't just be you pain. It would be you explicit pain, you painful explicit. The guy is in pain because it says so, and he goes to God. He doesn't talk about his pain till the end. He said, Lord, something in me says I don't have to sit where I am. I'm looking for something that will be a blessing to you and blessing to everyone. I'm looking for enlarged borders. I'm looking, Lord, for the hand of God. This is a whole sermon. I'm looking, Lord, because something in me knows I don't have to stay where I am. I hope it's Indian curry you bought. <laughs> Golly, guys. See, that is part of our position. If you've lost that, you've lost touch of the Spirit of God. Because the Spirit will dream in you. He wants you to increase in two things. He wants you to increase in the knowledge of God. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. 2 Peter 3, 18. And He wants you to increase in your measure. Ephesians 3, 19 and 20. He wants you to flow more in the measure of God. Can you imagine if you knew God better? Can you imagine if you increased in the measure of God and your knowledge and the weight that you carry? Because God wants that, so he puts that positioning. But you've got to want to get in your own race. If you, want, if you don't want to get in your own race, get, get rid of your kumbaya attitude. Well, what we do is we, we pay you to go and get hold of God so that you can bring the anointing in and drop it on us. But if it drops on you, it'll be like water off a duck's back. Because there's no longing. But when the longing comes, the position change. I'm ready to go further. And I just want to say something as I close. Don't let your history dictate your future. That's what we all do. I'm telling you, God wants to take you into a knowledge when a longing becomes fulfilled. Stop talking about hope pushed away always makes me sick. That's all we talk about. Instead of saying, I don't know how, but I will not stay, take away from my royal position to ask you to give me. So I'm going to finish it prophetically. I know, because I know. That sounds very, very frightful. It's not. I know because of my gift that the Lord has told me he's about to remantle churches. Then, then Paul has this dream, Greg has this word about our church. 
and the weight that we have had. I know he's going to remantle, which means he's going to change the destiny of the way the church operates. But I also know he's going to give it to people. Now, this is the age of patriarchs. It means not just young people. The, the way the world thinks is, chuck the old out, let's bring in the new. But God is restoring patriarchs, which means older people in God that have waited and prayed and stood are going to be touched by something that this generation wants. And this is a generation of grandparents. All right? Now, I'm prophesying to you, God wants to do that in this church. He wants to do that with me. I keep hearing it. He wants to do it with you. But you've got to see where you are in your position. Amen. So I'm just going to challenge you. Do you want, number one, more in God? Yes. I want hands. I don't just want mouths, hands. Yes. Do, you, do you want that your relationship with Him would increase? Yes. I want you, I'm going to do this in four stages. I want you to say to the Lord, I want my relationship to increase. Spirit of God, move me. Secondly, how many of you want to know that you know that you know that you know that you know that you're seated in heavenly places? That you know that you know that you know that you're in the kingdom for such a time as this? Then cry out, Holy Spirit, teach me, reveal it to me, mark it in me. How many of you are in circumstances where you just wish you weren't in? And honestly, you've taken a wobbly in the middle of it. And you cry out, Holy Spirit, you're working in me. You've begun the good work in me. I'm asking you to teach me how to stand and having done all to stand. I'm asking you to give me the words to stand with and the prophecies that I need. I'm asking you for the dreams to come up in me and overcome this that has come against me. Come on, pray it. Now the last one is this, Lord, stir me. Stir me, Lord, toward a longing fulfilled. Dream in me, my God. Speak to me, my God. Oh, God. I want to tell you as you're standing, and I want you to finish this in a crescendo, but I heard a sound many years ago. I've heard it once or twice in conferences, but it was in a local church. It was a sound that I can't explain. It was a sound like a roar. And it was a passion that had come out of the people of God. And I know it's supposed to be in here. And I'm saying, Lord, you gave me the dream and I'm not dead yet, sir. And I'm asking, Lord, that we will see the people come together with such a longing that that sound will be heard. It will be heard in heaven as it's heard on earth. Lord, do it, I pray. Fulfill our longings. Does anybody need to put their hand in their heart and say, Lord, I'm not where I should be. I'm committing my life afresh. Holy Spirit, I give you permission to invade me. Oh, Holy Spirit, fall in this place. This is me. Oh, Holy Spirit, fall in this place. Oh, fall on every person in this place. Me, Lord. Come on, I, I believe it's time to do business. Yes, I can come and minister to people, but it's time to do business. Lord, let what you do in me get into these people, Lord. Oh, God. Oh, God. I want to 
Honestly, I believe the Holy Spirit's in the place. I could prophesy, actually, I've seen, I've seen some things. But the Holy Spirit is in the place, and it's you and Him. I want you, I want you to understand that we are getting positioned by God for the next phase of our life. He wants some repositioning to go on. I believe that there are promotions. I've seen something about a couple of people in this place. I've, seen, I've even seen a business coming to someone in this place who looks in desperation. I've been honest. I've been faithful. But the Lord told me to tell them that I'm praying for them. To, he's going to put something in their hands. But not for you. For the fulfillment of His destiny. Yongi Cho used to talk about the fourth dimension. So look in the spirit and let the spirit, let, let the dream come into you. But it always starts with me repositioning myself. And so Lord, as a church, I'm asking for the repositioning. I know that some are here and some are away, but Lord, I ask as they watch it, the same thing will fall. My God. Draw me, draw me, draw me. Draw this church. Draw the ones watching. Draw us into the place, Lord, where we are positioned. Listen to me, guys. Where we are positioned for what God is about to do next. It would be horrible to not be positioned. Cool, brother. Some of you need to repent. Quick, I'm going to close this. But some of you need to repent and say, Lord, the truth is, I've just, I've just, just done whatever it was necessary to make it. Not anymore. No, I'm going to position myself to be drawn in relationship, in seating, in standing, and Lord, I want to follow after you. I want some testimonies of the things God did that looked like they were impossible because suddenly He changed you. take it serious guys I'm telling you I'm not just a preacher I'm a prophet and something is being offered right now in America to the church Man, come on, everybody on your feet, everybody if you can. Here's how we're going to respond to this. How many of you know this was a Romans 111 moment? What is that, Chris? That's where Paul said, I want to come among you to impart something among you. And I believe that Dennis imparted something in our spirit, man, today. How many of y'all feel pregnant today? No, just me? Okay, well, maybe it's just me. When the word of the Lord comes to you, it puts something in your spirit, it impregnates you. You get full of something. And I believe that's what happened this morning in the house. This is a moment of destiny, guys. I'm telling you. And, and I'm, I'm with Dennis. Take it seriously. But here's how we're going to respond. We're going to have a yes and amen on our lips this morning. In other words, we're going to connect our mouth with the word of the Lord. There's going to be agreement in the atmosphere. Come on, all over the house, begin to say a yes and amen. Yes and amen. Yes and amen this morning to the word of the Lord in our midst, to being remantled for a new season. Yes and amen. New beginnings in my life. Yes and amen. Yes and amen to destiny coming. My history being wiped out, but fresh future in my life. Yes and amen. Come on. Thank you, Lord. You got it? No, I mean, really, do you got it this morning? I'm telling you, Dennis is right. You could prophesy over people all through the house this morning. But unless we get it, what good is a prophecy? Right? Come on. Yes and amen. Thank you, Lord. Lord, in this house, we stand as a unit this morning, and we have a yes and amen on our lips today. Lord, I can't speak for everybody else, but I want to say yes and amen to a fresh remantling for the season you have for us. Thank you, Lord. And I'm telling you, some of the words of men that have been on your back, they're coming off your back in this season. Where they've kept you bound with things, I'm telling you, they're coming off your back this season. 
Come on, for you to fulfill what God's called you to fulfill. Amen? Amen. Bless you guys today. If you need prayer, we will have ministry teams, altar teams up here today. But listen, don't go out till you get the word of the Lord in your heart this morning. Amen? Bless you guys today. Love on one another as you go. Let this be a moment of destiny in your life today. Thank you for joining us online this morning. We bless you guys. Have an amazing Sunday. Get the word of the Lord. I love it. Good stuff.